Hey guys, um, so welcome to what's going to be a once a week series on applying machine learning to algorithmic trading. In this uh, week, I'm going to be talking about the triple barrier method, which is one way to label financial data. Um, said in a, in, a, in a rough, rough way, it's kind of like, let's say you, ha you bought a stock and now you have a uh, take profit and a stop loss. So the question is, what will hit get here first, the take profit or the stop loss? If the take profit gets hit first, the label is one. If the stop loss gets hit first, the label is minus one. And if enough time passes where neither get hit first, then the label is going to be, if uh, the price is higher than the, than the price you bought it, label is one. Otherwise, if the price is lower, label is minus one. So it's kind of like simulates real life in a bit. Um, so let's get started. I'll explain first... Um, other ways to label financial data that and why they might not be as good. Um, this is just going to be a small introduction. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm leaving out that I will hopefully put in either uh, next week's video or, or the week after. But I think a uh, small introduction is, is good for now. Anyways, um, let's get started. Of course, uh, my weekly plugin, my desperation plugin. If you enjoy my videos, please like and subscribe. It's not easy to make these videos. It takes a lot of time. So it really makes me happy when I see people subscribe. So thank you guys and uh, let's get started. So ignore these, uh, this code. This is just me uh, 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 using it to explain a concept later. So let me just real quick talk about other ways to label financial data. So the simplest way that might not be so good is to predict like the next closing price. So let's say you have daily stock prices, you're gonna to predict tomorrow's closing price or maybe the high price or the low price and that sort of thing. Um, the issue with that is the scale is a bit messed up. Um, so, it, it, so it's really hard to predict. It'll be very messy, a lot of variance, uh, um, susceptible to outliers, a lot of problems with that. Um, similarly, you could predict returns. You could predict um, the simple return, which is tomorrow's stock minus today's stock over today's stock. And even better is to predict the logarithmic returns, which is basically the logarithm of the ratio between tomorrow's stock prices and today's stock prices, or whatever time interval. Uh, these can be hourly, minute, or whatever. Or in, in the, my case, it'll be like every dollar bar. So it'll be the next dollar bar over the current dollar bar. So um, just real quick, um, regression is a bit of a mess. Um, it's In my, in my experience, uh, classification works a little bit better, it's a little bit more robust. But let me just quickly say, log returns are preferable to regular returns for one simple reason. Let's say a stock goes up, like a bipolar stock like Rivian goes up 50% and that then down 50% the next day. It's back, the, the returns uh, will cancel each other out and it'll be zero, it'll be additive, right? Whereas, um, let's say the opposite thing happens. Uh, let's say Rivian goes down um, 50%, Rivian's at 20, it goes down 50%. Uh, it, so that'll make it $10 because 10 minus 20 over 20 is 50%, minus 50%. But then let's say Rivian then goes up 50%. It'll only get to 15, not to $20. So the regular returns are not like additive in a nice way. We'll have other videos talking about this. I don't want to talk too much, but let's talk about classification. So um, Lopez de Prado, this book where I got this thing from, uh, talks about like um, a fixed time horizon method where um, basically most papers say like, um, okay, if the return um, in a certain time interval is above some sort of uh, threshold, let's say H, then it'll be plus one. Otherwise minus one if it's below minus H, otherwise zero. The problem with this is like, um, unless you're doing something like daily or monthly returns, if you're doing like intraday, like hourly or minute returns, then like the beginning of the day is so much different than the middle of the day or after hours. And then you're going to have the mess where you're really like gonna end up just predicting like the beginning of the day type thing. Um, and it's gonna be terrible. You're just gonna predict if it's the beginning of the day. Um, you can make this dynamic where it depends on some sort of like um, function of the volatility of the time and day. Um, which is a little bit better. Um, so that's another way to go about it. But okay, just one more quick thing is if you had uh, dollar bars instead of um, time-based bars, this could be a little bit better. But either way, 
it's lacking a huge thing. It's the path. Because like normally when we trade, we have some sort of take profit or stop loss. And even if we don't have a stop loss, like idiots like me don't use stop losses a lot, um, your broker will do a stop loss for you in the case of a margin call. So your broker stop loss, they will sell your stock for you um, in case of a margin call. So there's always some sort of stop loss. And of course, you can't hold the position forever. So that's where like the vertical barrier comes from. So let me like introduce like the triple barrier method for a second. Okay, so I'll introduce it with a few examples. So one example could be like, um, um, as you see, this is stock price. You have upper barrier, a lower barrier, and the vertical barrier. So the question is, what gets hit first? In this case, the upper barrier gets hit first, so then the label will be one. That's a very straightforward case. In this case, uh, the lower label, lower uh, horizontal bar gets hit first, so the label is minus one. In this case, this is a little bit trickier case, neither get hit first, instead of some vertical bar, enough time passes gets hit first, and um, as you see, the value is below uh, where you started. So you, can, you have two ways to go about it. You can label this as zero, uh, meaning like uh, none of them hit, but um, I think for me at least what works a lot better is labeling it as a minus one, and you can handle the distance between this with sample weights. Uh, we'll talk about it in a different video, but you would label this as minus one since the vertical barrier got hit first, but the return is negative, so that's why you label it as minus one. So the last example, and this is actually might be more of a reason, more of an example of label, labeling zero should be in this case, but, um, but like in this case, it'll be a label one because although the vertical barrier is hit first, it's um, positive return. Again, um, there, are, there is a technique with like sample weights to um, make sure that this thing gets less weight than like um, this thing where you clearly hit the top first. And by the way, like this thing is uh, interesting because like if you if you wait long enough, you're basically at even here. So that's why the path is so important. Um, path is really important in, in these things. Okay, anyways. Um, and by the way, I, um, this is outside the scope. In my code, my, my uh, barrier uh, gets changed every second in my algorithm, but like there's no way I can explain that. It's just way too hard. Um, Okay, anyways, uh, so yeah, as, as I was mentioning, like if the, if the return is small like here, you can set the label to zero. Um, and um, I said like sample weights can handle the fact that the label is small. I also wanna say a few more things. Um, uh, oh, you can choose the horizontal width based on some sort of like volatility uh, criteria based on time of day or some, fi if you're using dollar bars, sometimes the fixed value is, is okay, but like it's, some sort of volatility criteria is always good. Um, yeah, anyways, okay, so so now I'm gonna show you basically step-by-step -step way to calculate the triple barrier method from bars of any type. Um, now I'm not gonna be 100% complete. Um, there are intricacies that um, I'll talk about in other videos that you should be careful with, but um, this will give you the concept in a lot of detail. It's just overwhelming in one video to talk about everything. So like I'm assuming I'm going to be using dollar bars, but my base to create the dollar bars was five second bars. So first of all, let me remind you what dollar bars are. Dollar bars are bars where it depends on the do each. There's a new bar every certain amount of uh, dollar amount traded. So let's say every billion dollars traded is a new bar. So the advantage of this over time bars is basically with time bars at the beginning of the day, you have insane amount of volume and activity but in the middle of the day you barely have any activity in comparison so like it's a bit weird to compare 930 to 931 to 1230 to 1231 eastern unless uh it's after jerome powell speaks but he speaks at 2 p.m eastern so that's a different story but anyways dollar bars will kind of normalize this fact it'll make it like a bar is dependent on the amount of activity not uh the time of day okay so um the format, uh, so I also have another video on dollar bars. I'll put the link in the description or the comments uh, and you guys can uh, go back and see it. But, but basically, I'm assuming I start with a base of five second bars and I'm gonna sample it into dollar bars or some sort of um, uh, other bar. In my case, it'll always be dollar bars, but okay. 
So what's going to happen is uh, I have this function that will create roughly num bars per day. I set it to 100. And then you call it and you get dollar bars. So just for illustration purposes, um, the first bar, um, the start time, the first five second interval starts at 930. Um, this will be the 930 to 930 and five second interval. And the end date time will be the last five second bar interval would be from 930 and 15 seconds to 930 and 20 seconds. So really, if you think about it, like uh, this bar is actually till 930 and 20 seconds. So you'll always add five seconds to the end date time because the end date time is going to be um, the last five second bar in this interval. And um, the five second bar uh, is quoted from start to end. So five seconds later is the end date time. But um, I, I, I just kept them the same here. But anyways, just to give you guys the illustration. So if you look here, this one starts at 930. The last one ends at 930 and 15. So it's 930 and 20. So the first uh, bar of the day is 20 seconds. Well, if you go to like uh, um, this 1258 bar, you'll see that the first bar is 1257 and 15 seconds. The last bar is 1258 and 35 seconds to 1258 and 40 seconds. So it's over an hour. So like this one is like maybe uh, 10 seconds. Uh, sorry, this one is um, 20 seconds. This one's over an hour. So this show you guys, shows you guys how dollar bars work. Um, anyways, um, okay. So assuming this format, let's, let's talk about step by step how we would calculate the triple barrier method. So um, step one is you would add a vertical barrier so how do we add a vertical barrier? Um, so basically we want to add um, a barrier that's like num bars to vertical barrier apart. So let's say this uh, for illustration, uh, we're using minute bars, one minute intervals, and we have num bars to vertical barriers equals 10 apart. So we would have something like the bar from 930 to 931 would have the vertical barrier from 940 to 941, it'll be 10 apart. And 931 would have 941, 932 would have 942 and so on. So let me show you guys with code how you could do this. You can have this um, get vertical bars method. And um, what this is doing is it's um, taking uh, the events being like our index, the normal index, except it's gonna go up until, if we're using num bars to vertical barriers 10, um, it's gonna go up until um, 10 before the last. Um, and, um, and it's going to add a vertical barrier that's going to be t uh, shifted 10 apart. So as you see here, um, the vertical barrier starts um, 10 apart and goes on. Um, and um, the other one basically starts from zero apart and goes up to 10 apart. So if you um, take the first element of each, the second and so on, you'll see that they're always 10 apart or more generally num bars to vertical barrier apart. So um, let me show you the extreme example with the original five second um, data set. And I should have mentioned above that my base thing was a five second data set, just to be very clear. Um, and then I uh, resampled it into the dollar uh, bars. But okay, so from the original five second data set, if you run this function, um, it should be five seconds apart because the vertical barrier five seconds apart for one bar apart. So as you see, it goes 930 to 9305. Okay. So this is uh, this example, but like a normal case, you'd have like, let's say um, you'll have like 20 bars apart and you have something like this. And now you see uh, it's no longer one, five seconds apart. Now it's like an hour apart or whatever. And in general, if we look at some statistics, we can do something like um, events df dot vertical bar minus events df dot index dot describe. And you see like the, um, the median is about an hour 31 until the vertical bar. Obviously, like if you use a higher number here, it would be like way longer, that sort of thing. This is something you have to tune based on your application. But anyways, um, uh, as you see, the max is sometimes you have three days apart, which maybe you don't wanna actually do that because um, um, that will, uh, maybe you just want intraday ones. That's the one, you, that's what you care about the most. So actually you can, uh, actually you can basically remove uh, restrict the cases where um, it spans across multiple days. So one way to do this is you can look at the index, the date of the index and the vertical barrier uh, and you look at its date and you make sure it's the same. So now um, now if you run this thing, 
you see that like you never have the spanning across multiple days. You'll get a max of five hours, but you won't have a span across multiple days. Okay, so this is a step one of, of adding the vertical barrier. The step two is we created the, the dynamic volatility for target threshold. Um, as you'll see, we, can, we might even be able to even get away with a constant volatility, uh, uh, not a dynamic volatility necessarily, but more constant. You should always do this because like over like a, the year, things could change. Like, but like this will show an interesting thing that like across intervals, like uh, in the middle of the day, end of the day, um, you might not actually uh, need a different value if you're using something like dollar bars. That's the strength of dollar bars. So basically, the idea here is just basically calculate like the exponentially uh, weighted moving average of like um, these like lagged returns. So like let's say we're at time 14, we would calculate the exponentially weighted moving average of the standard deviation of these returns. And there's like a span parameter and the smaller the span parameter, the more this is like sensitive, um, um, sensitive to like changes early. What the larger the span parameter cares about the um, earlier changes a little less. But anyways, um, let me just show you guys uh, the example. So an example could be, um, uh, and by the way, you would multiply this by, um, uh, uh, you would multiply, uh, okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought, okay. So let's call this get, get um, volatility, right? So um, what this is doing is, okay, now it's similar to the other case. We're starting num bars lag apart. In this example, it was 10. Um, and um, those are the, t the times of the event. And the past points are 10, b 10 before that. So this starts at point 10, and this starts at point zero, the past point. So this will be 10, 11, 12, 13. So it'll be zero, one, two, three, four. 10 apart, right? And then you can calculate the log returns um, from the current point to the past point. You do a st um, exponentially weighted moving average, standard deviation. You get the volatility um, of that. Um, and uh, you can compute this. Like, okay, so now I can do like events target equals some number times this get volatility. Some number because um, you can choose the width of the, of the label. Like, um, you can have it one times this volatility or two times the volatility, or you can have the upper bar being one, the lower bar being two. Um, but because we care more about directions, we want them to be the same value in this example. But in the future value, future videos, we're gonna be talking about like um, uh, this in much more generality, but okay. So anyways, this, this is the way you get a target. And by the way, the first parameter was the num bars lag, which was like basically 10 in this example, 12 minus two is 10. 13 minus three is 10. And the second one is the span of the exponentially weighted moving average. The smaller the span, the, the more it cares about recent points. So as an illustration, what I could do is I can do something where like I can um, basically uh, um, sam uh, like sample to nearest five minutes. Um, let's say I do uh, four or five minutes, this is nearest five minutes. And then I can take the time part of this uh, um, uh, uh, subsample thing uh, time part by doing dot dt dot time. And then I can create an actual uh, chart. I can group by time and plot the median. Um, and then you see um, this is uh, higher at the beginning of the day, and then it gets lower and then it gets higher again, which is probably like, honestly, like what you want. Um, there is some stupid thing here where it's like less volatile here, just because the way it's computing it, it's using pass points from the end of the day. So you should, you, you even can add one more scale to that, but like I actually do prefer uh, um, not doing that because sometimes your target is like over, uh, over uh, wants too much at the beginning of the day. So it's actually maybe better to keep it like this, but just know it really should honestly be like that because at the beginning of the day, it's way more volatile. But as you see, like at the end of the day, it has a nice thing. But here I used five and 10. If I were to use the span of like 100, as you see here, um, it actually, um, it, it actually like, um, uh, it, it gets things to be a little bit um, uh, more the same. Uh, you know, let, let's, uh, let, let me let me do something else, sorry. Let me do a lag of 100 and, and a span of five first. So a lag of 100 and a span of five. So um, lag of 100 and a span of five actually looks pretty good. 
it, uh, it has the most uh, action at the beginning of the day and then it gets bigger. But if you were to increase the span to 100, it'll be a bit, it'll be like, see, it'll be, it'll be bad. It'll be like oversensitive, right? So, um, so maybe, um, yeah, so you want something like, so yeah, so you have to play with this uh, parameter. So maybe um, yeah, a span of 100 is used often because it's, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's more smooth, but it's, in our case, it's not as good. But look, if you do the mean and not the median, it's like pretty cool how it's like almost all the same value. Um, anyways, uh, maybe if I do 10 here, Anyways, uh, it's good to play with the span, um, the span parameter. Um, maybe this is the this is a good um, example, and then maybe uh, you let's just t you tell yourself like, okay, I'm not going to make any new trades after fifteen uh, twenty uh, into the new day. But like as you see, like this kind of makes the most sense. The beginning of the day is the most volatile, and then it gets like it basically gets a little bit bigger towards the end of the day. But like my point I was trying to actually make that I didn't make very well is um, if you pick these parameters in a certain way and, and you make things big enough, um, it could be that you have literally like zero, um, let's say I do 200 and 200 just for a second. Um, uh, yeah, so it could be like that you have, um, oh, uh, sorry, I, uh, I realized why uh, this is messed up. It's because I remove at the end. I did this artificial thing where I removed uh, spanning across multiple days. So artificially, I hired the um, the thing. But like, anyways, sorry. More of the story is you play with these parameters. Um, if uh, if you play with it enough and make them big enough, you can just use basically one value. You can just use like this zero point one three. Anyways, sorry for digressing. Now let's get the first time of each barrier touch. So basically this is the first time you hit either the vertical, horizontal, or the um, uh, uh, horizontal upper or lower barrier. So um, the vertical barrier touch, we already calculated because by default. So now we just need to get the first of the lower or upper. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna set like the upper barrier to the, um, the target and the lower barrier to minus the target. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the path prices which means we look at the path from the start of the event um, going uh, until the vertical barrier, um, excluding the first point, which is the current price. And then um, um, we're going to divide that by the first price, which is the current price. And this gives us our log returns across the path. And from their log returns across the path, we find the first time it goes below the lower barrier. And uh, we take the minimum index, that would be the first time it hits the lower barrier, lower horizontal barrier, and if greater than or equal to uh, the upper barrier is the first time it hits the upper barrier. And then we do this uh, barrier earliest is out.min, it takes uh, lower barrier earliest, upper barrier earliest, and vertical barrier, and it gets the minimum value. So it gets the first time it hits. Okay, so this is how you get the time of the first barrier touch. Okay, so now we wanna get the log returns at the time of the first barrier touch. So basically, this will be the log returns from the barrier barrier earliest. Uh, um, that's the end period to the start period, which is like the index. So to do that, we would do this function, um, uh, get log returns, um, and then uh, early, we, call, we call this to get earlier touch DF. Um, it'll get the time of each uh, barrier touch. Um, and um, now we calculate the log returns by um, dividing the earliest touch from the um, start of the interval, which is the index, and then we get this early uh, this uh, log return data frame. So this log return data frame, if I just use it on like a sample, this df .close is basically okay. Sorry, I, I should have made it clear that um, the close is the closing price of your smallest gran most granular thing. So like in my case, it was five second bars and the vents DF was like less granular and it was dollar bars. So the five second bars would be the close and this would be the dollar bars. Cause then like uh, if a dollar bar is like three hours, you can have many uh, times in your five second bars that you hit the threshold. Um, so that's why it's like this. So like this is the same thing, except now we call this method. We get the earliest uh, touch time 
And then we calculate the returns by dividing the value, uh, the closing price at that time, from the closing price of the index, meaning the start time. Um, and just to show you on the um, last uh, uh, 10,000 bars of the dollar bars, how this will look like. And I, I put that described to get like uh, the statistics. And you see like the mean is, uh, this, it's weird, QQQ is going nuts now and the mean is like this in, in my example. But maybe it's because uh, I'm using like 2002 data and stuff like that. But as you see, the median is about like, it's very small because this is QQQ. So it's an index. Um, so it's very small, but like um, uh, the max is, uh, it, uh, and, uh, yeah, so the max is uh, like 1%. Um, yeah, QQQ is really small. Oh, and I also used, uh, obviously I used, um, uh, I, I might have used like uh, small um, numbers for things. Uh, this way, if you change your uh, um, your targets and that sort of thing, if you change your uh, bar sizes, I use like, oh, I use vertical bar in 20, right? If I were to do vertical bar every 200, this value would be bigger, that sort of thing. But anyways, like forget that for a second. Um, now you can get the classification labels. So this is just uh, the log returns and now you just need to take the sign of this. So like this uses the log returns from here and then the next step, it, it returns label as a sign of these returns. So uh, to show you guys how to do that, I'm gonna show you um, how it's calculated in the first 20,000 bars. And then I'll do value counts to get the distribution. Um, by the way, I'm explaining this in a very confusing way, but if you read the this book, it's also, <laughs> you have to do it, you have to a few times to read it before you understand it, it's hard. Um, it's just very time consuming to, um, fix these videos. But anyways, now you can drop rare labels if you want, um, which you, you should, I, I'm saying. Uh, oh, I already had that. So you can do like um, label doesn't equal zero and then you get value counts. It's uh, skewed a little positively. Um, I guess if you look at the recent uh, way the market's going, um, QQQ is going nuts. Unfortunately for me, Tesla always goes, goes down, but um, that's how you get like the distribution of the labels. So I didn't have enough time to go over like a lot of things here, but like you would also wanna like um, not just have the labels at every um, uh, dollar bar start. You would also want a uh, dollar, uh, dollar bar. You would wanna like maybe sample that when some like event happens. So like, for example, it can be like um, when um, some structural break happened. Uh, Lopez de Prado has a thing called Q sum. So like uh, when like, uh, let's say a 5% um, uh, up or down uh, thing happened or whatever. If a 5% up happened, that, that's when you start the event and then you predict, will the next thing be a 5% up or 5% down? Or you can have filters on other things. You can also, this is my thing I, I did a few times, a sample based on incoming news articles um, and that sort of thing. So we could talk about this in another video, but it's good to know about. There's also like meta labeling, Lopez de Prado talks about that a lot. It's a thing where like you can have like um, your favorite algorithm, like a MACD crossover, RSI, Bollinger Band, whatever, that tells you like whether you should trade, like, like let's, that tells you whether you should go long or short. And um, let's say uh, that algorithm tells you to go long, then based on that, you have a machine learning algorithm that will tell you, um, should I actually make this trade or not? Like, um, so you have the primary model telling you you should go long and the secondary ML model tells you should I make this trade or not? And another thing we wanna talk about is sample weights, um, which is very important. Um, A, for the fact that you can have overlap between the labels. So like, um, let's say you have one label that uh, depends on 9.30 to 12, and one that depends on 10 to 13. There's overlap between 10 and 12. So you should like, maybe give that less weight because it's uh, the overlap and it's less unique. Also, um, uh, you shouldn't treat all the classification examples as the same. So like this example here, um, this you should treat in a different way. This is clearly, this is up uh, um, a positive label, but here it's kind of a weak positive label uh, here. Like it's barely above. So you should give maybe more weight to this label as opposed to this label. So sample weights is something that you can play around with. Sometimes I don't use it, but sometimes it does help. I, I just want to say so. A for dealing with like 
the uniqueness and like the overlapping labels and B for the magnitude of the labels. And also sometimes you want to have like minimum uh, magnitude um, of let's say like the moving target as we calculated here um, and of the um, label itself to use and maybe also multiprocessing. So like this was a very hard video to explain, but I thought it's better to just send this video off. Uh, we can do a new video when I improve my practice on explaining this. I hope this is useful for you guys. Um, there is a, um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the video, but there is a YouTube channel called um, Hudson and Thames, YouTube, Hudson, uh, let's do triple, triple barrier. So there's a, a, a method called, um, uh, they have this, uh, they have a triple barrier and, uh, and um, rules detection. So you might want to look into them. Uh, and that might help. Anyways, uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, and let me know below. Thank you.